Welcome back to Apocalypse and Genesis. So what are we seeing? Not only does history tend to run in cycles, but by limiting our memory of the past, the archons allow us to commit the very same errors that taught humanity not to graduate last time. Hubris plays out then in all the arrogant old ways, leaving God in the unenviable position of hovering his hand over the redo button before we make things worse. The phrase hic sunt draconis pops up on a 500 year old globe, theoretically engraved by da Vinci. It shows here be dragons in an area to the east of India where Marco Polo must have seen or heard of monitor lizards. For our purposes, however, the dragons of the creation can be Elenenki, Marduk and Tiamat, or objects of the incoming Nibiru system, if you prefer, when the Aries dragon comes to town. I loved the image on the stone because it shows everything is about to get screwed up. Our orbit, our ecliptic, our poles, even life itself will take some wild turns. When the interplanetary magnetic field goes down and we pass through the galactic current sheet, we will again have chimera, elevated cancer rates, and the Bible says burnt scalps. Read your old myths. The sun is about to get super active, then die down, followed by cold weather and massive cosmic rays. And it happens every 13,000 years or so. When I was a kid, and I realize that's ancient history for at least 85% of you, we used to have these inflatable punching bag toys with a little bit of sand in the bottom. And they were hard to knock over because of the center of gravity being so low. But if you tossed it up in the air with a bit of centrifugal force, then it would make an arc like a comet and come back down again on its foot. At the risk of being laughed off the internet for oversimplifying, the Earth is kind of like that. The Bundahitian says the sky goes right in Taurus and left in Aquarius leading me to believe that the default of the planet is to rock back and forth like a top winding down. And yet we have these ancient stories saying the Southern Cross is going to come to Northern skies, sporting a snake slain by a lion. And it happens about the time a heron or dragon drops in from heaven and a falcon rises like a phoenix. Another way of describing it was that the sun gets pushed about by a dark star. So our concern is that we have arrived one of these critical times when everything that can go cosmically wrong does. And the ancients knew about this time, the hermaphrodite alien gods, Jupiter and Saturn cored about the tree of life like a couple of goats. And they knew that four times a precession, Sirius would rise out of season and the earth suddenly fall 45 degrees. Like the inflatable clown being tossed up in the air, Earth passing through the galactic current sheet will suddenly change our definition of up. And as we hit the magnetic null zone, there is nothing to hold the poles pointed toward Polaris and Canopus. On the contrary, they'll be drawn to Lucifer and the Son of God as those celestial objects race by. And they will be the two prophets or the two witnesses you've been waiting for. And it was kind of the point to your whole religion. The story of the Aquarian reversal is written on this eye of Ra. Depending on how the light hits it, you can see the eye or you can see Sirius below Orion as the footprint of a heron, as the Elhaz rune of the Futhark, or as a trident, if you prefer. Now choose a constellation in the sky and tell me how you might look at it upside down or backward. And the obvious solution is for that planet to change, uh, for our planet to change orientation. So the way we've been seeing Aquarius for thousands of years is as an eye of Horus, a left eye. And we are about to see it as a right. The ancients expected this to happen about now when Aquarius, Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio over the course of a quarter precession, followed one another around the zodiac like the seasons of a year. 
the Egyptians, once accustomed to observing vernal equinox with Assyria and Babylonia, will next year celebrate May 6th. The Jews will celebrate Passover from April 22nd to 30th. Christians will observe Easter March 31st. Muslims will observe Ramadan and Eid between March and April. But basically, everyone is trying to remember the world starting over as it had to around 4500 BC when the visitors dropped by over Taurus. I believe Thoth or Kenef is the first prophet to arrive if you follow Deuteronomy 18, making Horus or Isis the second prophet, the king or queen, a contender to the throne. In the eagle eye above right, I see a triangle, so one or both of them are associated with that trajectory of the Aries dragon we've been expecting. Taurus was the sign of apocalypse 6,538 years ago. On the opposite side of that stone is a foot, the sign of the phoenix, the son of God who lights up this place. I always appreciate it if one of you chooses to send along some inspiration. In this case, it was Steve, I mean, Nine of Diamonds 350. He basically agreed with that Eye of Ra stone that next spring we could be cruising into trouble with the creator gods and the arrival of their avatar. And the assembly of the gods next spring will declare the age of Pisces officially at an end, and it will be time to renew life to begin again. Here is Steve's date again. The vernal equinox as they once celebrated it at Babylon and Assyria. Andromeda is uh, riding the hippocampus, a Neptunian horse, and you can see the stars that Neptune is uh, indeed at Pegasus, and the one saving Andromeda from the dragon Cetus is uh, indeed Mercury. So my belief is that the sky must fall like the dolphin, Delphinos, that top constellation, and as it does so, the one rising will be the Messiah of 4 Ezra 12, Leo. I'm convinced the Tower of Babel was not how the ancients insulted God. They insulted God precisely the way the billionaire class is doing it today, by playing God. So they tinker with the DNA of the foods we eat. They manipulate the DNA in your body through bioweapons called by the name of a designer virus, in treating you with infected vaccines nearly as dangerous. They screw with the water you drink and toy with the air you breathe. They have twisted every human value that served us for millennia, implemented policies to bring down the nations, and they're ramping up their totalitarianism. And now they want to mess with your brain. So forget Genesis 11 and read the Nam Shub of Enki from which it came. Once then, there was no snake. There was no scorpion. There was no hyena. There was no lion. There was no wild dog, no wolf. There was no fear, no terror. The human had no rival. One nation then, Sumer, that land great with the me of lordship, Ur, the land of everything right, the land Martu, resting secure, the whole world, the people as one to Enlil in one tongue gave voice. And then did the contender, the En, the contender, the master, the king, Enki, the one with unfailing words, Anafani, the shrewd one, sage of the gods, gifted in thinking, the En of Eridu, changed the speech of their mouths. He set up contention in it in the language that had been won. In other words, for at least part of the Bible, Yahweh is Enki of Sumer, and the one who saved his Noahic family from the flood is the very same one who confounded our languages. Now, is Musk a savior of mankind or just another one of the bad guys? Personally, I think most of us are a mixed bag of good and evil. And the usual problem we get into with technology is that it is never brought to the people with any kind of morality built in. We just sort of foist it on society and see what happens. 
So for instance, as long as I've been alive, we've been outsourcing, downsizing, offshoring, and automating industry without a single consideration of what we're doing to society. So instead of there being more and more productivity and therefore more leisure time for improving the lives of workers, we use the profits to centralize wealth into fewer and fewer hands. And we have cut benefits to the point that a young couple may be holding down three or four jobs trying to make ends meet. And a single mom with children can't afford insurance. And many of the millennials feel like the American dream is some kind of fairy tale invented by delusional grandparents. I applaud Musk's professed uh, caution with respect to artificial intelligence. And I would advise extreme caution with respect to chipping folks into the Borg. For years now, we've been listening to academics and politicians tell us we can't be trusted with the First Amendment. And the private enterprises tasked with policing themselves seem to do so with the even-handedness of the Justice Department or the Internal Revenue Service. As a result, public discourse has become weaponized. And it's getting to the point where even would-be allies are going at each other. I'm not sure how democracy or republicanism as forms of government might survive in such an atmosphere. In the Bible somewhere, it says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, allow me to add a corollary. The ones who fall to that temptation are often trapped by a second that is even more dangerous, the love of power. And those avatars of arrogance believe that life in all its forms is designed to serve them, to be created, fostered, manipulated, or destroyed as they see fit. So you might know the data on your computer is not your intellectual property. The papers and photographs and videos you save to the cloud are not exclusively yours. They are being perused like a data farm to build the dossier on you and improve the AI. Well, at the beginning of COVID, believe it or not, Microsoft filed a patent to subject your every activity to mining for the purpose of applying cryptocurrency transactions. In other words, your coming social score for which China was the guinea pig will be measured by every means possible, like exploited like a coal miner in debt to the company store. Any user of what they perceive as their machine, server, or network will be considered a consumer without autonomy. And beyond that, Gates intends to colonize the minds of your children to make them even more effective digital slaves than you were. If you have a moment, check out Bandana Shiva's book, uh, Oneness Versus the One Percent. I suppose if it's really the end of the world, then what Mr. Gates does might not seem important. But my gut tells me that the oligarchy is very much going to shape the end game. We have before us a very brief opportunity in which to prepare. FEMA could announce a lottery system for the arcs, vaults designed to protect people, food, water, literature, and art. I'm familiar with the DOD doomsday teams and I never once felt like any consideration was given to our families in the plan. Even a publicized strategy for national triage would help people to prepare mentally for what's coming. We have government agencies with the wherewithal to determine which lands will fall and what lands will be protected. And I've never once heard them suggest what is to be purposely abandoned or where safe haven might lie. For that matter, they never confirmed officially that a few nations are ready and on contract to take displaced Americans. We treat underground bases as a secret. We consider stargates as woo-woo. We regard very real skulls of several races of alien humanoids as science fiction. And instead of doing something, anything, to ensure the survivability of humanity, we focus on starting World War III arguing about the rights of sexual deviants to go into the wrong locker room, whether atrocities are okay as long as they're perpetrated by Palestinians and Ukrainians, or which president might command respect for the nation. Well, it's high time we rethought our priorities. Shema bless you and keep you now and forever. Take care.